Hello, my name is Phil White. I'm the vicar of Broughton Church and I'd like to share with you a, a sermon that I, I gave yesterday on Sunday the 12th of September. Um, the reason for, for recording this again is that unfortunately our streaming, uh, we're having problems with streaming at the moment and so I wanted to record this because I think it's a, an important message that we hear as a church. Throughout September we're, we're working on a, a series with um, if you like three words a, a process of three words and the first word is reality in other words what what is the reality we're finding in in life at the moment um, secondly the, the in order to move from that reality the tough reality we find ourselves in now we need to have hope in order for the third word which is the results hopefully we'll see new things coming out um, in this process so moving from reality through having hope and then seeing results as a, uh, as a result of that, as it were. And um, each week we're going to be looking at a passage from the Bible or, or a, a story from the Bible to help us. And uh, last week I spoke about Joshua leading the people from uh, the desert area, from the, the wilderness into the promised land. And today I'd like to speak to you about, um, really it's about a six week process or a six week period from basically when Jesus died through to Pentecost and that's what I'm going to be speaking about in a moment uh, and ne next week Shirley is going to be speaking about another passage and then Joe will be uh, finishing the series towards the end of September. Let me read to you that passage from uh, that I want to use this morning and this is uh, taken from Acts chapter 1 and it's the first eight verses let me read those to you now. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What was it that turned that group of a dozen or so, 11 frightened fishermen, tax collectors, and all sorts of odd, odd bunch of people? What was it that turned those group of people who were frightened into a force that changed the world? Um, the two answers that I came up with from uh, looking at the New Testament is, is very simple. That first of all, uh, the risen Jesus appeared to them so Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them and I think that would have done an amazing thing for that group of people and the second thing is that we read at Pentecost of the Holy Spirit coming the Holy Spirit being poured out upon them bringing them power and I'm recording this today in the in the bar area at the canal basin and I did that deliberately because um, I, I, it, it's a place where beer is pulled here and spirits are poured out etc and so this is a, a bit of a representation for me that actually we remember the Holy Spirit coming not not brandy and whiskey and gin and so on but when the Holy Spirit was poured out on those first disciples and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to sort of meander through the story. We're going to, we're going to look back at that first century uh, and the passage I've read and the, the, the six weeks around about that period. And we're going to meander through the story. I'm going to tell the story and remind you of what happened. But we're also going to come back to the present and we're going to meander through our own present. And uh, for many of us, it's a bit difficult. It's quite challenging at the moment. Let's start with uh, that passage and the surrounding chapters and so on from uh, the New Testament. Uh, 
So let, re- let me remind you of, uh, of what's happened in the story so far. And I'm going to take you way back, six weeks back to just before Easter. This is Maundy Thursday evening, which we remember the day before Good Friday. And what's happening? Well, the disciples are together in an upper room. We're in an upper room here at the Canal Basin. They're together in that upper room. And they're they're supposed to be there for a Passover meal, but actually it's just a bit different. Jesus changed things. I mean, he said, he broke the bread and said, he gave it to them and said, this is my body broken for you. And after the meal, he took the cup and, and poured the wine. and This is my blood shed for you. What was he talking about? He's adding things, he's changing things. And then later that evening, there's the arrest in the garden. And you remember Peter, he swings his, his sword and cuts off the knife, the, off the ear of one of the servants. He then, through the night, there's the trial. And then Good Friday morning, there's Jesus being crucified. And just think, way back to that Passover meal the night before, just 18 hours and Jesus is dead. Everything has changed. Everything in an instant has changed. 18 hours where their hope has gone. We go through Easter Saturday and they're pretty low, I would imagine, thinking Jesus is dead. What's, what are we going to do? Then Easter Sunday, If you remember that Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to the disciples and to his friends. He's alive. Jesus is alive. And that's the first thing that changed them, I think, that actually the risen Jesus appears to them. So let's just remind ourselves of those appearances. There was Jesus appearing to Mary at the tomb. And do you remember she thought he was the gardener? And it was only when he said her name, Mary, that actually she recognised him. Then there's Peter, I love this passage, there's Peter and John running and there's almost a race and one overtakes the other and so on and they get to the tomb. Then there's the Emmaus Road where two of them are walking along. I don't know where, presumably they're walking to Emmaus, I don't know. But this stranger come up with, that comes up to join them and says, you know, what, what are you talking about? Why are you so sad? And they say, haven't you heard? And then Jesus opens up what we would call the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures, and tells them what must happen. And it's a a fantastic part of the story, but they only recognize him when he breaks the bread. Just thinking back a week, maybe days, a couple of weeks, I don't know, to when that that Maundy Thursday Passover meal that he changed things, they recognized him and then he disappeared from their sight. Then Jesus appears to the disciples behind locked doors because they're frightened stiff. And then later, Jesus appears to Thomas. And you remember Thomas said, I'm not going to believe until I can put my fingers in the holes in his hands. And Jesus appears to Thomas uh, to let him know that he's alive. And then a lovely story of Jesus appearing to the disciples on the beach. And uh, they've been fishing all night and they've caught nothing and he's cooking breakfast for them on the beach. Jesus meets them again at the end of Matthew 28 uh, on the mountain. It says, he said, I'll go to the mountain, I'll meet you there. But what I love about that passage is it said, some doubted, even though he was right in front of them. We have the ascension then where Jesus rose into heaven we have Pentecost where the Holy Spirit comes down. And uh, there's a sort of offhand remark in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8, which where, Paul, where um, uh, Luke describes, uh, sorry, Paul describes there that, he, that Jesus appeared to over 500 people at the same time. And those, that group of people went on to change the world. We live in 2021 now, which is the 2021st year after Jesus' birth, give or take a few years. But history has been defined in terms of years because of that. 
I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether you've ever thought about it, but what what do you think were the emotions that the disciples felt during those six weeks? And actually, when I was speaking about this yesterday, Pat very helpful, dis- helpfully described their emotions were like this, up and down. And I, I wrote down that it's like a, a roller coaster. I think they would have been all over the place, full of hope one day, and yet Jesus has gone the next. And what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? He gave us a big task. What are we going to do? Let's come back to reality and to normality now. Normality, what is normality now? We don't know, but what about today? Well, I, we've been through a, a, a lockdown over this, well, several lockdowns, haven't we, over this last 18 months? And it's been strange in that some people have been even busier than they were before. Just typically, if you look at people working in hospitals, nurses and doctors, they've been stretched to the limit many times. And yet others have been on furlough. They've been um, told full pay effectively, but you can't do any work. And almost an enforced holiday. Um, We watched, I don't know whether you did or not, we we didn't actually, but um, we watched watched church in our pyjamas perhaps. We we watched when we wanted. Maybe we said, I've got the washing up to do more this morning, I'll I'll, I'll watch this afternoon. And maybe we didn't, I don't know. Uh, To some extent, we, we didn't have to make much effort with church, did we? And there was very little commitment needed. You either watched it or you didn't. It was, we couldn't meet with each other and so on. And I think over this last 18 months, we've lived with fear and distrust and anxiety. And I think it's made many of us very wary of getting involved again, unless it's been effective. So I think it's, it's caused us to step back. Many people are like that, I think. And it, it comes to, brings to mind a, an analogy. Um, Anne and I decided to try to run 5K. Uh, we wanted to try and get a bit fitter, so we downloaded the app, and it, over nine weeks we got from couch to 5K. It took us a week or so to get out of the house, but we did it anyway. But, um, and the funny thing was that we, at the end, we, we were proudly telling our family that we could now run 5K. And uh, one of my sons said to me, Dad, uh, how, how do you know that you've run 5K? And we said, well, we said, well, we followed the app. And the app says, run this, this length of time, and that's 5K. And, and he said, well, hang on, it depends how fast you run. You don't know whether you've run 5K or not. Anyway, uh, to my embarrassment, I checked it out, and we measured the distance, and it was actually 4.6K. So we'd got a bit more to do, but we, we got there, didn't we? But, you know... Anne and I haven't run more than once. We've run once in the last four months. And it's felt like hard work. We've lost the habit. We've we've lost that enthusiasm for it. It feels like just too much of an uphill struggle to run 5K again. And a man called James Lawrence from CPAS, which is Church Pastoral Aid Society, he described something called acedia, Sorry, hiccup there. He described acedia, which uh, the word acedia and the word sloth are closely linked. And acedia means a spiritual apathy. And I think we've seen that. We've seen that apathy that, that particularly coming out of lockdown, I can't be bothered. We've seen fewer people willing to serve in, in ways at church the way they used to. Not everyone, I realise that, but quite a number of people have experienced that. But what was it, going back to the story in the New Testament, what was it that spurred the early church on forwards? Well, two things, as I said, Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them many times. We've got the benefit of we know that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that, we, we trust that and that that has to be part of our hope that drives us forward. Secondly, the Holy Spirit empowered them. Um, We're going to take a little bit of time at the end of this talk uh, just to wait on the Holy Spirit because we definitely need the Holy Spirit's presence and power in order to move us forward. As a church, just to, I think one of the things that people are wary of is getting involved in something that's not effective 
So we want to be doing things much more effectively than we were doing before. Uh, I had a sabbatical in May, June and July, which was fantastic. And I thank you, church, for allowing me to do that. But it was a very influential time for me. Um, during that time, I, I, came, I came back to work with the word effectiveness really so that it was ringing in my ears as it were we've got to make sure that what we're doing as a church is more effective can i just give you an example of that we started bc families uh, uh, yesterday on on the, the 12th of september and um, bc families had started it was a zoom based thing it started way back in september october last year and james faithfully sort of delivered that each week with pat and ellen helping them and there were four families generally that joined with them um, and uh, I think there were seven children altogether. But we wanted, to, we wanted to bring that into reality, into actually a building like this. So yesterday we started BC Families and we had 14 children there and 17 adults. It was brilliant, fantastic to see the children enjoying themselves and playing with crafts and what have you. And I think we were more effective in working with the children than we have been previously. And one of the great things is that there's someone already talking to us about wanting to take that on, taking the leadership of that on. So I'm really thankful for God for that. I'd like to share three analogies of, I think, the reality we face at the moment and, and how we put hope into uh, what we're doing. The first one is a fishing trip. Now we were speaking to Phil and Sam yesterday and Phil had been fishing uh, last week and uh, it had not been a particularly fi successful fishing trip. So I want you to come with me almost and let's go and sit next to Phil as he's fishing. I don't know whether he was on a river or a canal or a lake, I don't know. Maybe Phil, you can, you can give me the details later. But can you imagine, you've been up all night and you're sitting in your shelter, you've got your, your rods out across into the water and you've got your I think they're called bite alarms, which are these electronic things that whenever the, the rod moves because there's a bite, the alarm pings, or, or it's, it's not like the pinging of the app, but it, 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 the little bell or whatever. And you know, you're waiting for the fish to bite and nothing's happened. Maybe you can remember back to the story that I reminded you of earlier when Jesus appears to his disciples on the beach and he, he's cooking fish for them on a fire. And the disciples are out in the boat about 100 metres out or so. And Jesus says, have you caught anything? No, we've been out all night, nothing. And they don't recognise him. And he shouts, put your nets on the other side. And I can imagine the disciples, what, we've been doing that. What is he talking about? Anyway, they did. And they caught 153 fish. But back to Phil, fishing, nothing's been caught. And wouldn't it be so tempting just to give up and go home? But I know what kept Phil going. For a start, he loves fishing. But secondly, was he had this hope that he would catch something, that actually his patience, his determination would produce results. You'll have to ask him about it. What about a second analogy? Mark Harper was here yesterday and I was, uh, I was imagining Mark uh, with this football team at Swindon he supports but um, I said imagine at half time you're 1-0 down and Mark shouts actually it's 2-0 down. But imagine this, the, the situation where the, the team go into the dressing room, the manager's there, the captain's there and they're sort of huddling around and they're, they're giving encouragement to each other. Come on, I know we're 2-0 down, we can do it. And maybe the manager or the coach or whoever gives them a new tactic. I want you to try this. I want you to stick closer together in the defence or whatever. Whatever, I'm, I'm no footballer so I don't know. But can you imagine that the sort of the demoralisation, the sort of, the, is it worth going back on? We're 2-0 down. They need hope. They need an injection of hope to be able to go out and play. And then the third uh, analogy. I was, um, I was on a woodworking course last week and um, uh, I was making a chair. And basically we were given a large piece of flat piece of wood, about, about 50 millimetres thick and it was a piece of ash, a beautiful piece of wood. And basically we had to put it on an easel 
uh, and we were given this. Um, uh, it's well, a, a, a long version of these is called an ads. I don't know whether the, the smaller one is called an ads, but you have to hold it in your hand, and it's got a, a blade on the end. And basically, you just do this process. Now, I don't know whether you can see. I'm trying to I'm making an arc, and you you just chip away at this piece of wood, and you're trying to get the 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 ads to to not just dig in, but to sort of scrape. We then used a, something called a Frobisher, which is an amazing piece of quick kit. Uh, just a handheld thing with a blade in it, and you, you have to scrape it across the wood to smooth it out as you're making this um, bottom-shaped indent into this piece of wood. And you had to work hard at it, and it's really tempting just to give up because it's very hard to use. But when you get the right technique, then you actually can produce some results but it's really tempting to give up. It's just too hard. Let me tell you about my hope, just as I'm coming to a close here. Uh, let me tell you about my hope for us as a church. As a church. Uh, my prayer and my hope is that we will be more effective in what we're doing. I want us as a church to be doing things that make a difference in people's lives. I want us to use more uh, coffee shop in Parton Road, not just for the three mornings that we're able to open as a coffee shop and Anna Dean is, is using one, one another morning in a week for sort of um, parents and toddlers and whatever, and little babies, uh, babies group as it were. I want, we, we can use it every afternoon if we want, we can use it every evening, we can use it Saturdays and Sundays. I want us to be using more, more than those se sessions we're currently using it. We've got, we're very fortunate, we have a narrow boat which we keep here at the canal basin. I want us to be using the narrow boat beacon for people who need a blessing. Let me say that again, I want to, us to use our narrow boat beacon for people who need a blessing. It is, it's an amazing thing to go on that boat and we're not able to use it very much at the moment. So I want us to use it for people who need a blessing. In, lines, in line with our, um, if you like, our, our strap line we're using, if you like, at the moment, that we're brought in church, that we're all seeking to be brought on in our faith, brought on, and that each of us is able to say we've brought one to Jesus. In other words, something about growing in our faith and something about sharing our faith as well. I want us to be able to, to tick those boxes and say, yes, we're doing that. I want, us, I want Broughton Church to be a place uh, which is spoken about on the street, as it were, uh, a place that is a place to find God, to fly, find peace, to find contentment and joy. And I want Broughton Church, my, my dream, as it were, is that Broughton Church will be a community where we know we're loved unconditionally where we find acceptance and welcome, whoever we are, whatever our lifestyle, whatever our gender, our colour, whether we've got faith or not. I'd, I don't mind. I'd like Broughton Church to be full of different types of people, different people seeking and looking for different things. We sang a, a, a lovely uh, version of, uh, this is from Thy Kingdom Come. We sang a, a lovely hymn uh, with a modern video setting. And the chorus went, went like this, transform, revive, and heal society. Let me say that again. The, the, the song was, was singing, transform, revive, and heal society. That's what I want Broughton Church to be. And we're trusting that we will see lives changed as a result because we're being brought on in, in our faith and we're part of brought one, as it were, to Jesus. I'm going to suggest, uh, do this at home if you wish to, it's fine, but um, um, if you feel comfortable, wherever you are, providing it's relatively private, as it were, um, if you'd like to hold your hands out in front of you as a sign that you're saying, Holy Spirit, will you come? Will you visit me? Will you refresh me? Will you fill me with hope 
like in that dressing room at half time on the football pitch. Fill me with hope so that we can go out and change this world. You might want to stand wherever you are, remain seated, that's fine. Hold your hands out if you feel comfortable to do that. And I'm just going to be quiet now for a few moments as we wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We ask you to come and revive us, refresh us, and empower us to heal our society, heal our land. Holy Spirit, will you use us? Will you fill us with hope? In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you for listening uh, today and uh, hopefully we'll be able to stream our services again on Sundays. Uh, but I hope, uh, I hope this has been helpful to you uh, today as you listen. Goodbye.